Okay, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about um, photogrammetry. And essentially we're going to talk about some elements of photographic systems and how it works. And uh, most of this stuff is in chapter 2 in the textbook. <coughs> the plan for the night is to cough instead of yawn. So let's uh, talk a little bit about how a simple camera works. The object comes through some sort of a feature. In this case it's a, a pinhole or a lens and it goes through and focuses and you end up with this image of whatever the thing is that you're looking at but it's typically inverted. And uh, that's essentially how your eye works and it's essentially how a camera works. But the thing that we want to make note of here is this notion of the focal length which is the distance between the lens and where the image on the film would appear. So just more basic camera stuff. Um, focal length is that you know from distance from the lens to the camera. Uh, it's also the distance between the lens and the photo plane or the distance between the lens and the object. These are all different uh, forms of things we, we, we look at as well as the exposure which is based on how bright things are and how much time it's it's open to it. And then there's geomet uh, geometric factors and exposures. Exposure is lessened as you move away from the focal point. Uh, distances uh, are longer at the edges than they are at the center, and this can create some problems. So we'll talk about a lot of these things, and hopefully it'll start to make some more sense. So when we talk about photographic systems, what advantages do we really get? Well, the first one is you get improved vantage points because you can literally take pictures from the bottom of an airplane thousands of feet in the air. Uh, you can also have a st have this ability to take stop action uh, elements. In other words, you can take pictures uh, sorry, I started yawning um, of something that's happening and you just get this freeze frame snapshot window in time. And it's, Photos are also good for recording history and they also collect a larger range of spectral information. They have much more spectral sensitivity than what your eyes do and they have increased resolution or fidelity. In other words, you can pick up more details and more clarity in uh, photographs than what you can with your eyes. So let's review a little bit of the history of photography. In uh, about 1839, the concept of photography kind of became public, and by 1940, people began to advocate using it uh, for topographic surveys. In other words, for making maps of things. By 1858, the first aerial photo uh, was taken um, in near Paris in a balloon. And in 1882, the, they had adapted the technology and took the first photo from a kite. And by 1890, the first textbook on photography uh, was written. And by 1908, they were taking photos from planes. And by the time World War I got into full bloom, we were taking reconnaissance photos to see where troops were stationed and positioned on the other side. So here are some examples. Um, left nadir elevating photography uh, to the condition of art uh, is, the, is the title. Uh, and this is published from 1862. In the center, this is the earliest aerial uh, image that was taken in Paris uh, by Nader. Uh, in the right is Boston. This is from a tethered balloon um, in 1860. And you can begin to see how you gain a perspective that previously uh, you just simply could not get. So what did early aerial photography look like? It was the wild, wild west of technology. In this example here we're looking at biplanes, the old uh, first sort of uh, somewhat viable aircraft that we had and here we have some of the different setups that they used to take pictures. One we have uh, on the top you have it mounted on a device to point straight down. Another one you have it uh, mounted on a turret very much like you would a machine gun where you can just aim it and take the pictures of the things that you want. Um, George Goddard uh, was an aerial photography pioneer invented some of these reconnaissance cameras. Uh, here we're looking at uh, a photo of Rochester, New York in 1925. And this is a night photo. 
And so how do you take a photo at night? You use a flash. And in this case, they used a flash bomb. Uh, <laughs> 80 pounds of flash powder, which is a whopping pile of it. And it lit up enough of Rochester that they could take this aerial photo. So as we move forward a little bit in history, by the time we get to 1930s, USDA began collecting aerial photos. <sighs> it's some selected counties, and this was all related to the Dust Bowl because we had such widespread erosion and drought crippling uh, the breadbasket of America. Um, they needed to document this to show this to people who weren't there to see the devastation, to see the impact of what was going on, and to try to uh, begin to get people interested in trying to just fix this to solve this problem. So they began taking photos. By World War II, um, we had become prolific at this and we begin the widespread collection of what we call stereoscopic photographs. Now stereoscopic photographs are unique. Imagine a camera with two telephoto lenses on it and that's essentially what a, um, a stereoscopic photo is. It's two photos taking at the same, roughly the same time of roughly the same place where one is offset from the other and slightly. And with this offset, it allows you to set the pictures up such that when you look through a stereoscope, which is basically a, a fancy pair of viewing glasses that allow you to put one picture framed under each lens that goes to each eye. And so you have two similar but different pictures of the same location. Uh, and then the overlap is significant between them. You place a picture under each lens and you line them up so that when you look through them you only see one image. And this actually generates what appears to be like a 3D element to the image and allows to do a lot of interesting things. By 2000 um, we had the widespread use and availability of digital aerial platforms and uh, pretty much was the end of the aerial photography uh, for you know these sort of purposes uh, as far as not being digital. So how does one systematically take photos from an airplane? Turns out it's not as easy as you would think. The obvious answer would be get a camera, go into a plane, take pictures. Well, in the early days that's kinda how they did it. They got in the airplane and took pictures. but as we require more from the pictures uh, we have to do more. So here is an example of the goosenecks in the San Juan River in Utah. From the camera there's some information we need uh, and, and to do this to make use of what we're talking about. The first is the altitude above ground level and that is the distance from the film plane within the airplane so if you imagine that whether it's a sensor or if it's a camera or with roll film in that aircraft at some point that thing exists and we need to know specifically how far it is from there all the way to the ground looking straight down from the camera onto our target onto the ground making a nice 90 degree angle uh, there's that center point and that is called the principal point and then the other thing is, based on the curvature of your lens, you capture an uh, image of a certain width. And that field of view turns out to be important as well. Now, if we don't take pictures straight, we can take what we call a low level aerial photo, or a low oblique aerial photo rather. And this is when your angles are off to the side as we see here not straight down. Your principal point is your optical axis is not directly under your airplane and you get an image much like you see here. High oblique aerial photos are a little bit different. Uh, high oblique aerial photos tend to flatten out the terrain because it's at a s much uh, steeper pitch. Um, how do you tell the difference? Well, it 
has to do with what you can see or not see in the image. Flight strip. As we're taking pictures, you imagine that view that we're talking about in the previous slides. As you're flying along, here we have six photos being taken. And you can see that each photo overlaps another photo. And in fact, when you look at photo one and what is covered, part of it is covered by photo two, and even less, but still part of it, is covered again by photo three. And this perpetual overlap going through allows you to have the stereoscopic pairs that we talked about. Now the other thing that happens is what we call um, uh, in-lap, which is the stereo part. When you look down here at the bottom line, you'll notice how they don't line up perfectly straight. Well, you get some edge variation, and that's because the wind blows and it moves your aircraft around, and so it's almost impossible to fly in a perfectly straight line. But in this example, you see this line going across that bottom section of images. That line is if you were to trace the airplane's position on the ground on these pictures. And they call that the nadir line. So if we go on with this a little further, we have this flight line, which is our nadir line going from the center of each image to the center of the next image, going through, and we lap around and come back and make another pass and then another pass and then another pass. What you see is that not only do you have significant overlap from picture to picture within the flight line, between flight lines you have side overlap as well. And the purpose of this is to guarantee you get 100% coverage and that everywhere that you want to look you have a stereoscopic image. In other words, there's at least two vantage points for every location on one of the pictures. When they put them all together, it looks something like this. Here's all these photos laid down, stacked out as an index to show you uh, where things are. And then we have two obliques. One is a high oblique, and one is a low oblique. And what I want you guys to do before class the following week is figure out what the difference is. Now, I'm going to tell you what it is, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. In one, you can see the skyline, and the other, you cannot. That is how you tell a difference. I'm not going to tell you which one's which. You guys got to figure that out on your own. It's in the textbook. It's, you can Google it. Uh, and then I expect you guys, when we talk about this in class uh, next, well, in two weeks, that uh, you'll have the, uh, at the beginning of class, I'll say, any questions? And I expect one of you to raise your hand and say, yeah. Uh, hi, oblique is this. Uh, low oblique is this. Okay? Good. Alright, let's talk about film. Well, what is film? Well, film is just this medium where we can harvest specific uh, frequencies, frequencies of electromagnetic um, information from a, a specific moment in time. And the way we do this is we have some sort of a base uh, here we have an example of film or of photo paper. The same, the process is basically the same. Uh, if we have the uh, base film, like the polyester film, like you would have in a camera, has some sort of emulsion, which is this mixture of gelatin with silver halide grains in it, which respond to light, and from that uh, we can develop it out and. and uh, get uh, a negative which we can then use to put onto a paper where we're looking in the same emulsion, the same gelatin, the silver ha uh, halide grains and ultimately end up with the picture. So let's talk a little bit about black and white photography. Typically um, we're talking about pan chromatic or infrared sensitive film. And what is the difference? Well here we have two lines, one being pan chromatic and one being the infrared and you see that the panchromatic goes out to just a little bit past the red and stops where the uh, infrared sensitive goes out through the near and far infrared to encompass that as well. 
So when we talk about panchromatic, we're talking about ultraviolet, blue, green, red. And that's pretty much it. Whereas the infrared also includes the infrared. This um, illustration here, uh, on one axis, shows the log sensitivity. In other words, uh, how sensitive it is to these uh, components. And then on the other axis, it shows the wavelength of uh, electromagnetic energy, or the light, if you will. And, of course, you remember that uh, 4 to 5 is blue, 5 to 6 is green, 6 to 7 is red. So, panchromatic film, or photographic film, is sensitive to all visible colors on the spectrum. That means, from the blue, the greens, and the reds, it is sensitive to those. How does color film work? Well, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, we have to use various filters and various combinations of these gelatin matrices with different um, photosensing compounds in them so that we block certain things and then filter certain things. Uh, and so, for example, we start off with a, a layer of material in the film that is very sensitive to blue. Okay, and then right immediately underneath of that is a layer that blocks all blue light. And then immediately below that there's a layer that is sensitive to green and blue, but the blue has been blocked. And then below that there's a layer that is sensitive to red and blue. But again, the blue has already been locked. And below that is the base and the backing. And what happens is, first comes in all the light, the first layer reacts with the blue, then we filter out the blue, and then the next one will react with green and blue, but there's no blue, so we just get green. And the next one, red and blue, but there's no blue, so we just get red. And the illustration at the bottom sort of kind of walks through that whole concept. So, well, let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, we've got A, B, C, and D. A being the reflectance of objects in the original scene. B is the film after exposure, C being the photograph after processing, and D being the resulting color when it is viewed. Now, if we go over to the very top row on A, we go over to blue. Basically, blue comes down, it hits the blue sensitive layer, which is then activated. Next is the blue absorbing filter, which filters out all the blue. The blue then doesn't react with the green or the red, and it comes down, and the photograph after we process it ends up being uh, clear so that whenever we send the white light through it uh, the magenta and the green light up or get absorbed and ultimately leads to the color blue showing up on the picture. Same way with the green same kind of process and it follows through following the same kind of a uh, scenario ultimately leading to the green and then the red and then um, if you have near infrared it would show up as, as black in this sort of scenario but you get the idea how it works color infrared film um, is kind of interesting it has blue green green red and then red to near infrared that's the colors that, that are grouped together and it was developed in World War II and it was primarily designed to uh, spot things that were not vegetation that were painted to look like vegetation and it would work like this I'm not going to go through all these when they haven't been there you can spend a little time pause the slides if you need to to understand but basically this just shows how uh, with different types of, uh, of uh, things what shows up what colors now I talked a little bit about filters. Um, becoming selective about the electromagnetic energy that we allow to reach our film or sensor is what filters do. Um, most are absorption filters, the most common. They absorb a range of frequencies based on the colors that you select, but you can also have polarized filters that are used to do things like reduced to reduce glare. And so, for example, incoming light might be scattering in all different directions. A polarizing filter only allows it to 
move in the up and down direction and you end up with this transmitted light that is polarized uh, because we know that light moves um, in uh, a waveform but that waveform is not strictly speaking up and down it sort of rotates and so uh, this eliminates all of it but the one direction and makes it uh, less glaring so when we talk about reflection and transmission what are we talking about light coming down made a red green and blue hits an object the green and the blue are absorbed and that means that the object looks red that's a little hard to get people to understand sometimes the color you see is the color that is reflected from the object not what is absorbed so the green and the blue become absorbed the red is reflected therefore the object looks red now when we talk about transmission it's a little bit different if we have something that is a red filter it absorbs the green and the blue and lets the red go on through so let's talk a little bit about these black and white film types panchromatic and black and white with infrared here we have the exact same location taken with these two black and white films in the panchromatic it's sensitive to all spectrums of light within the visible range and you get this nice gray image but when the black and white with infrared is one of the ones we use um, it is sensitive to ranges outside of the visible light spectrum the infrared and that turns out to be very useful for doing certain things in this case that forest uh, differentiates really quickly between the deciduous and the conifer trees because the deciduous trees um, are much lighter in the infrared again panchromatic versus black and white you can see which trees are which types of trees you can also use this same technology to look at uh, soil moisture because the difference between these two leaf structures and this particular example is the absorption or reflection of uh, infrared light by water molecules so we have this panchromatic landscape and then we have the same thing with black and white infrared and you see the areas that are much much darker that would be water or wet soil and you can actually make out the river in the black and white infrared whereas you can't in the panchromatic the river being that dark snaking outline that goes through the image on the right where the little arrow from the word water points to so we've talked a little bit about some of these other things about what uh, these camera types are and everything and, and the types of film and what this is all about what I want to talk about now is something called photogrammetry photogrammetry is the science and technology of obtaining spatial measurements and other geometrically reliable derived products from photographs when we talk about hard copy that's real old school sort of you know paper photos soft copy that's the digital photos that we typically work with now uh, in the past uh, the standard process was getting photos having them developed and doing everything with the hard copy um, now uh, we do the same things but we do it with the soft copy uh, but we need to understand how the hard copy works and that way you understand how the soft copy uh, processes make sense so there are a bunch of different areas of photogrammetry and we're going to go through a bunch of them but the first one uh, we're going to talk about here is determining scale of a vertical photograph and eliminating the horizontal ground distances All right, or in estimating the horizontal ground distances and the way we do this is made, it's made from measurements of a vertical photograph and so scale basically is a mathematical relationship between the distance measured on a photo and the distance on the ground and ranges of scale relate to changes in elevation if you know what the scale is, it's really easy to measure the distance. If you know what the scale is 1 to 5,000, you measure an inch on the photo, it's 5,000 inches. However, if we're going to use area measurements, that's more of a problem. If you're going to make them on a vertical photograph to determine equivalent areas in the ground coordinate systems, um, it's going to take a little bit of computing. 
But area is basically a simple extension of the first one. If you know the scale, you can figure out the distance in this direction and the distance in the other direction and do a little bit of math and voila, you know the area. Quantifying the effects of something called relief displacement on vertical area photography or photographs is a little more complicated. What is relief displacement? Well, photographs do not show uh, true to the view of objects. The top is always displaced from the base. This is called relief displacement. Objects tend to lean away radially from the principal point of the, photo of the photograph. So when you're taking a photograph straight down into a bunch of trees, if you're directly on top of a tree, you'll see the top of the tree. All the trees around it will appear as if they're growing out from the, the center. To determine how tall objects are, you can take some measurements from this relief displacement and with a little bit of math, and it's not super complicated math, I believe they call it trigonometry, you can figure it out. And while a form of image distortion um, is a pain in the butt for some things, it's really cool and useful for estimating the height of objects. The magnitude of the distortion just depends on how high you're flying and how far from the principal point to the feature. And then when you combine all this with the radial position uh, and and relief displacement, we can figure out how tall things are. So I'll show you some stuff on that a bit later. It's now a bit later. So here's the gist of this. Airplanes up there at L. Down there on the ground at zero is the object principal point of the photo that you're taking. Off in the distance from that, there's this tree, and it will appear to be moving away from the center when you make a photograph of it. So the bottom is just how it actually exists. When you move up to the photo, you'll see that on the photograph it looks like it's pointing um, down to the left. You can get a distance measurement on that. If you know how high you're flying, then you can figure out the other things. And uh, from that, you'll notice that that conveniently helps us work out a bunch of triangle shapes. And the thing about triangles are, if you know an angle or two, you're in business. And with basic trigonometry, you can then figure out the actual height of the object on the ground. So how do we do this? Uh, we measure something called image parallax. Parallax is the difference in the apparent position of objects viewed along two different lines of sight. And it's measured by the angle or semi-angle of inclination between those two lines. So the thing that we were just looking at on the previous slide, you gotta look like that and measure like that from two different locations. And by knowing how far apart those are, you can calculate this image parallax and, and uh, figure out how tall things are. And here's how it works. Overlapping images, same section of ground, two images, looks different. It allows you to then do some math and voila, you get some answers. Now, how do you do all this? Determining the elements of the exterior orientation of aerial photographs, uh, it's a pain. In order to use photographs, there are six parameters that you have to know, okay? And you want to know this because this is going to definitely 100% be an exam question. you got to know the x values of the coordinate system, or the coordinate axis, at the instant of exposure relative to the origin and the orientation of the ground coordinate system used for mapping. Likewise, you got to know the y, and you got to know the z at the instant of exposure. And then there are a couple of angles you have to have. These elements of exterior orientation, you figure this out with things like ground control points, GPS's, and inertial measurement units. From these things, you can calculate out what you need. And after you have all that stuff, uh, you can go into the production of maps, digital elevation models, and ortho photos. Traditional hard copy, hard copy stereo pairs to make maps, uh, measure angles to get distances, and you calculate all kinds of stuff. Uh, the, 
the other thing we do is generate these undistorted images. These are what we call ortho photographs. They've been ortho rectified. In other words, that radial displacement that we talked about earlier, that stuff is removed from the image. And a lot of times we can integrate that with contour lines from digital elevation models and figure out heights as well. Uh, we also look at this a lot when we're preparing our flight plans. Um, if we're going to acquire vertical aerial data, we have to consider um, uh, the seven things we've already talked about. And we have to plan for what we can do in all these uh, scenarios. We have to select a specific flight parameters that maximize the utility and the ease of what we're doing. Uh, we have to think about the data volume and the image scale and the ground sample distance, how our camera is set up, the size, the focal length, how much overlap do we have, how high are we flying, the distance between the image centers, total number of images we're going to collect. We have to really pay attention to a lot of this stuff. So what are the basic geometric characteristics of, of these uh, things? Well, if we're talking about vertical or oblique, um, there's virtually no vertical. Everything uh, is somewhat oblique. But we correct it with simple techniques and generate some minimal amounts of error. Uh, we typically use digital models. That way we don't really have any loss of accuracy. And then the type of obliques are high and low. Here's the answer to the question I asked earlier that I said you had to answer in class next week, the week after. If it's a high oblique, you can see the horizon. If it's a low oblique, you cannot. So we've got our nadir line, which is that uh, jagged line with dots in it that go across the bottom. That is the center point of each uh, picture being identified by the dots on that line. And then the, the dashed section of that line is the basically playing the connect of the dots. At a minimum, we want 50% overlap for stereoscopic coverage. And we need to know our air base, which is our distance between the photo centers on the ground, and the ratio of the air base to the flying height. That allows us to figure out what the vertical exaggeration is. The larger the ratio, the larger the exaggeration. Larger base um, height ratios result in more accurate interpretations. So let's look at the geometric elements of vertical pho photographs a little further. The distance from positive to negative, is, uh, we'll talk about in the next slide. We want to talk a little bit about these fiduciary marks. These are marks that are on the photographs. Uh, uh, X is the axis most closest to the flight line. So when you draw a grid across your uh, photo, you have the X axis and the Y axis. The X axis should be as close as possible to the line of flight. The y-axis is always 90 degrees perpendicular to the x-axis and this allows for us to measure you know, in a Cartesian fashion. Uh, it also corresponds very well to the way that digital data would be collected with raster data with columns and rows. Same sort of scenario, height above the terrain, the height of the aircraft above something. Uh, we have this principal point we're looking at, the optical axis, we have the field of view, some exposure and some negative and lots of different angles we can calculate given all these things. Ground coverage and area assessment is a function of many things, camera format, the focal length, how high we're flying, it's dependent on the devices that we use to measure on the image, uh, image scale variation, and then the transparent grid and cell counts are also important. So we've talked about some of these things a little bit. Here are some examples. Relief displacement of vertical features. I want you to look at the image on the left and you have these two cooling towers and if you notice ever so slightly uh, the hole on top is not as big as the bottom because they're you know towers are not uh, funnels. Uh, so the base is larger but when you look at these photos the base of the, of the cooling tower on the top appears to be down and to the left. The base of the bottom tower appears to be to the left. And the reason is both of these are radiating out from the principal point of the photo, which is somewhere in that grassy area where those roads are to the right of those buildings. Now you can't notice it as well on the larger photo on the right. Um, 
because it's easier to miss, but the image on the left is it's simply a zoomed in shot of what you see there on the right. And here's sort of how that works. Um, if you have an ortho photograph, uh, it'll look like the one on the left where everything always looks like you're looking straight down. Until you ortho rectify it, that will not be the case. Here we have the same two trees. We have the principal point in the middle of the picture. Corresponds to the L value there. Uh, and then you can see that from that we get these angles um, to the trees. And on the image above, you see exactly what that means. The one that's relatively close, uh, but much further down, appears to be going and pointing up to the left. The one that's down and to the right, um, it's much closer to L because it's at the top of the hill. And so it appears to be exaggerated even more. Image parallax is about the apparent change relative to position of stationary objects. So you move airplane to a new location, take the same photo, the same thing, but from a different spot. Uh, and you can then use uh, the parallax of this difference in the size that looks to be, but doesn't. And from that, you can figure out things. And the way we do this is uh, you take preceding and succeeding photos, and you ID the center. And that pair of points are called the conjugate principal points. And that's a paired set of points. And so here we have uh, two images where we can sort of see how that would work and look at how the two area, the area from A to B would be different <coughs> relative to um, Y and Y prime and how that would actually play out. And this is what that would look like. And the image on the left is the first photo and you have the radial displacement of the cooling towers from the principal point. The principal point on the photo on the right is on the other side of the river and you see the exact same two towers are now radi radially displaced in another direction. Appearing to be in a different location, leaning a different direction, when in fact they're not. Ortho photos do not contain scale, relief, or tilt distortions. They're basically photo maps, but like a photo uh, all true with all true distances and angles and they're made from conventional perspective photos and digital elevation models. Multi-ray photogrammetry is when we have photo mapping that exploits a large number of mutually overlapping images simultaneously. So think of the things that we've been doing where we had like maybe 50% overlap and imagine that you had 80 to 90% overlap from one image to the next. This would allow you to uh, measure things many more times uh, at much greater detail and so it increases your accuracy and facilitates uh, near total automation because it's not that you ever have to find a, a missing image if one has a problem for some reason you can just kick it out uh, because you have so many and so that's one of the big advantages of multi-ray photogrammetry So just to get an idea of what we're talking about, we've got this box sitting on top of the ground, and we've got um, a single image that encompasses it. If we have 60% image overlap, you can see how that same uh, box would be viewed in two, but not in three of those pictures. Whereas when we have 60% overlap, it's in the first picture, the second picture, the third picture, and part of the fourth picture and so you have much much higher rate of coverage. Back to our elevation displacement um, again uh, once you have um, this information it's easier to calculate these things out and figure stuff up. And we do it with parallax and overlapping aerial photos. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the distortions. One of the most common ones is something called tangential distortion or tangential scale distortion. And it turns out that our various systems of acquiring spatial data from aircraft uh, behave in a lot of different ways. And we're looking at one here that's called, uh, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> a whisk broom scanner. And so this is a, a, a camera or sensor 
of some sort that mounts on the aircraft that acts like a whisk broom. Instead of pointing straight down and taking single pictures, it rotates from one side back to the other side. And as the plane moves along, it takes pictures in that uh, uh, construct. And so you're constantly getting pictures at different angles of different things. Um, so you generate quite a lot of data. But this tangential uh, technique does create distortions specific to it. So if you look at x, or delta x, the change in x values uh, from going straight down, moving to the left to the red, from the blue to the red, and then from the red to the green, um, where it really shows up the most is the distance on the ground that the same amount of space uh, in the sensor would measure is different. Looking straight down, the width at ground level is relatively small. You move over to the red one, and the same uh, sensor will measure a greater percentage of the ground, and same same is true with the green, covering more area from the same sensor. And so when you have tangential scale distortion, it, it sort of wallers your image around a little bit and stretches some things out like it's not supposed to. So on the left we have a photograph, and on the right we have a thermal uh, Im we have thermal imagery that was uh, collected with a whisk broom scanner. And notice how we get these curved lines and distortions. That is a product of the tangential distortion. All right, so if you want to get um, maybe some better explanations on that, you can go to this YouTube video here at this link and watch this, and it'll um, provide you some additional insights into what I'm talking about.